is massive doors. And if those doors were open in the late 60s, 70s, and 80s, what came out of those doors, I believe, would have ended pretty much civilization. All right, I just arrived at the Titan Missile Museum. Um, I went inside, there's a few things. Uh, no flash photography here, uh, no tripods here. I can only take one camera in here, so I would like to take the Osmo Plus because it would give me that smooth image when I'm walking around, but in order for it to connect to the cell phone in here, I'm getting some really bad signals, and we're gonna go 35 feet below the ground. So just a heads up, this video is gonna be a little shaky because I'm gonna take the Canon camera down with me and just hold it and, and go with the flow. So I apologize. Oh, 1986. Hello and welcome to the Titan Missile Museum. It's top side. First of all, I'd like to direct your attention to that big tan structure over there. That's the best concrete you can get. That's all some of the best steel you can get. It is battleship grade steel. It covers our big missile and it weighs 760 tons. And do you believe it can be opened in about 19 seconds? That's covered by those gray scoops. That shoots out a radar beam, Doppler radar. You break that, you have an intruder. Your more important scoops, in our opinion, are right over here. They guard what's around that yellow band. No, not that air conditioning equipment we have on there today. That's where all the fresh air went into the LCC, right below that. That's where we're going, folks, right down there. You didn't want any bad people throwing any disabling agents down there. So let's go down below. Let's go down and look at this thing. That second telephone call. Commander inside would unlock this door here. The replacement crew would open this door. They would come in here. That door would shut and lock behind them. This door is shut and locked. They're stuck. These sites at this day were really built for nearby missiles because Russian rockets were not that accurate. So this is a very survivable scenario. However, in the event of that nearby miss, everything you're standing in right now, even though it's very, very well built, would likely collapse. But not this. This is the star of the hardened area. Folks, these walls are four feet thick. You will find areas this complex where the walls are eight feet thick. Build the best concrete you can get. Inside this concrete are steel reinforcing rods between the size of my thumb, most of the size of my forearm almost double the centeredness of industrial constructions. Three-dimensional, in many places where they touch, they're welded together, not wired together. The entire outside of this is steel plate. See the buck welds up here. That steel plate does three things for you. A little bit of extra glass protection, partial form for your concrete, but most important because you'll see grounding wires all over the place. This provides an electronic shield. Now, why do you need an electronic shield around this? Yeah. Well, exactly. Your immediate byproduct of a hydrogen bomb explosion are electronic magnetic pulses, EMPs. These pulses destroy anything electric, anything electronic. This shield would ground those pulses to the ground, prevent them from coming in here. This whole room, no, this whole building. Folks, we're in a three-story building. Our entire three-story building is shock icy with all these gigantic springs around us. There's eight of them. When you walked in here, you came across the bridge. We are that far from that four-foot thick wall. When that shock wave started shaking that four-foot thick wall to pieces, Captain Don in here wouldn't even spill her coffee or coke sitting right here in the council. They're knocking her cigarette out of the building in the 1960s extra. That's one good thing that's changed since then. <laughs> Deputy Commander said here. We had party lines. Deputy Commander was a first lieutenant usually in training for this job here. Now, the Deputy Commander was primarily responsible for three things. Communication. All these radios right there attached to all those antennas we talked about at the top side. In the event that the soft antennas were lost, deploy the hardened antennas out of their own side from right here. Who wouldn't have an ATM card? You ever have that uh, rain freeze and get your pin number? How many tries you get? Oh, come on, no one's been there? Three. Three, right. Well, folks, you got six here. Do you know how many tries you got before you? On that seventh try, that valve mount missile actually destroys itself. And someone from wing maintenance has to come out and completely replace it. And folks, that's good security. And my hat goes off to the planners of this program for building this level of security in here so to prevent a unauthorized person from launching this missile. The Air Force designed this program to last just 10 years. 
If you go back in history, in the mid-70s, you'll find that the Cold War was still going hot. The government wanted to keep this program going. They never had a problem. Electronics really advanced themselves, and they were there out of replacement parts. So what they did is they went back to the manufacturer, GM, who they knew was working with MIT that day, to design the new Universal Space Guidance System for Boeing's brand new 747 Jetliner. So the Air Force just paid back off that. All these panels go blank right here. Look at this. Consolidated Electronics. And then, Commander, you go to the top line of your message, and you get the last bit of information in here you need to launch that missile. And what is it? Six characters. We just talked about it. Out of millions. The butterfly code. That's the first and only time that butterfly code comes in here to prevent an unauthorized launch is with an actual launcher. You read the butterfly code off the BMAT, BMAT does it in there. It's go. You take your launch key, you break the seal on your lock, you put your launch key in right here. Deputy does the same thing over here. Folks, these are the real keys that will launch this missile. These keys are seven and a half feet apart. It takes two people to bring these keys at the same time. You have to turn them to the right and hold them there for five seconds in order to enable this launch. <laughs> Three, two, one, turn, turn and hold. Hold it there until that green light comes on. Tell me when it comes on. It's on. It's on. You can release. Your job is done. Now that green light indicates we have a good key turn, indicates we've been a good butterfly valve right there. On top of the missile are two 28 volt batteries that have been inert. These batteries are being charged up for the very first time. It takes 28 seconds for these batteries to charge up. Once these batteries are charged up, that computer, that power takes over. We are bystanders. Once it's charged up, we have that 760 ton blast storm starting to open. It'll start opening when that light comes on right there. It takes 19 seconds for that big door to open. It's going to break our tipsy beam, so we know that it's open. The computer on top of the missile is doing a last minute guidance check with our get down here. If the guidance is go, the engines will fire. When the engines fire, all the fire alarms on the side will go off simultaneously. When the engines are at 77% thrust, the four gigantic hold down bolts will explode off on both sides. <laughs> four seconds later, we have right here. Lift off. Folks, that was 58 seconds between that time that key was turned to that missile's on the saddle. Tens of minutes faster than that first generation of missile. How big? This one bomb was 600 times more powerful than the bomb we dropped on Hiroshima in World War II. How big? This one bomb had three times the explosive power of all the munitions we fired off in World War II in both theaters, including the two atomic bombs, including our allies, the rest of the allies. Three times the explosive power. Measured in tons of TNT, how do you get your head around what 9 million tons of TNT are? It's simple. You load that amount of TNT onto a railroad boxcar from the floor to the ceiling. You'll find your engine right here in Tucson, and your caboose is going to be way up in Canada. It'll be a 1,500 mile long train to hold 9 million tons of TNT. But fortunately, the key never had to be turned. It didn't have to be turned because of the turn. Peace of turns. But for deterrence to work, we had to instill in the mind of enemy the old fear. They were attacking us or our allies. They were going to be destroyed too. These 54 large missiles we had in the south, plus the 1,000 minute man missiles we had of the day up north, plus all the B 52, B 58 bombers we had on Earth 24 7, all the Navy support submarines we had under the ocean, all the Army Jupiter rockets we had in the Earth today, were the means to do that. And the will to do that was a highly selected, highly trained crew members, like a Vaughn Morris, sitting in chairs like this all over the country, willing to follow orders if so ordered. They're taking a picture. All right. Now we just walked through the short cableway. We walked through the second blast lock. Now we are about to enter the long cableway. Now look at the slack in our lines here. Our power lines, our communication cables, our water lines right here. Folks, we are now in a steel tube, a half inch steel tube, just surrounded by dirt. So we're like a submarine under the water.
to do that today. One of the things that I found very interesting on this tour when it was over is the guy said that he loves when he gets youngsters out here about between the ages of 10 to 15 years of age because he's amazed that they know nothing about the Cold War, they know nothing about these missile systems. And then he said, you know what, he gets 20 to 30 year olds that again know nothing about the Cold War and know nothing about the Titan II missiles or, or what we were going through in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And us to go and take this and put this out there on uh, all of our social media so we get people, more and more people, to come and check this place out to get educated. So this is the ramp where you go up and you can get a view of the Titan II missile from the very top. He said to watch out for this glass because of course it's extremely hot and it's it's actually cooler today. It's only 95 degrees right now than it is in Phoenix. But we'll see what kind of uh, what kind of view we can get with the sun just kicking in here. Oh, it is a phenomenal view. But the, the, like the gentleman said, this is one of the most powerful weapons that this country ever invented, and we're looking right down on it. Actually, standing right on top of it here. <laughs> 